comes from. Because she lives, she, she, she's she, a little wild. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she definitely has that kick inside her. That's. <laughs> I just want to say that you're listening to the Paranormal Lounge on the DTM Wicked Radio Network. Christopher. Absolutely. No, no, Victor, please, you take the next one. So, Beverly, how can we tell if a relationship is heading off the tracks? The first sign for me is when I stop talking. If I'm, if I'm silent, that's, 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 a, that's a problem. Um, not, and I don't mean when I'm going in the sacred solitude or when I'm thinking about something, but if I'm afraid to say something, then I know I'm, I'm way off the track and I need to pull myself back. I've let fear rear its ugly head and I have to take myself in hand and say, what is it I'm so afraid to say? What question am I afraid to ask because I'm a, because I fear the answer? How often do we do that in relationships where we will not ask the hard question because we are terrified of the answer? Do you want to be in this relationship with me? Are you willing to work with me on it? When you're in bed, this is what I would really like. Is that okay with you? Would, would you be willing to give that to me? And I really want to know what you would really like. Will you share that with me? And, and I, you know, I really don't want to go to your mother's house. She's disrespectful to me. I feel <laughs> that you go. But I'm not going to go and be hurt anymore. That, that's my boundary. To, to ask the hard questions, make the hard statement, and then stay in the room until the conversation is done. Uh, in the book, when we talk about the love letters, one of the things that Adam required of our relationships that we could sit, what he called in the fire together, which means we sit on the couch, one part or another of us would be touching the other person, and we would talk, and whether it was things we wanted to hear or things we didn't want to hear, and we would stay until it was done. Back to Victor's, you don't go to bed angry, and you also don't go to bed empty. Absolutely. Think about that. How often do you lay in bed next to your lover and you don't feel known and you don't get take out. the time to know or touch them? Absolutely. Get out. Absolutely. You yeah. know, um, something comparable to what you were just talking about, uh, there's a, a type of therapy called imago therapy. I'm sure you're yeah. familiar with it. Uh, created by a gentleman by the name of Harville Hendricks. And it's a very, very powerful couples relationships therapy in which uh, you sit together and you bring up something that is troubling you or something that the other person does that troubles you. And what you do is you state what it is and then the person has to state it back to you. And in the process of opening up this channel of communication, amazing healings take place. And I'll tell a very quick story of my personal experience. Okay. Um, my wife is a wonderful woman. She's brilliant. She's written 22 books. She's been an editor of major magazines and websites. Um, she has a, a chronological challenge. She's not time sensitive. Time doesn't mean a lot to her. And uh, I'm the driver in the family, and I would go and pick her up at various functions that she was at. And uh, I would call her and say, I'll be there in five minutes. And her five minutes is sometimes 30 minutes. And I would sit in the car and wait for her to come out, and I'd start getting anxious and angry and upset. But I'd never verbalize it to her. I'd, I'd just hold it in. And during the course of one of these Imago sessions, I told her this, and she says, let me understand. You repeat back what the person said. Let me understand that um, when you wait for me, when you're in the car waiting for me, and I take more time than I have committed to, um, you get upset. And in her repeating that back to me, it brought back a childhood memory, and this is not an abandonment thing, but of my father parking someplace to do something, and I'm talking five or six years old, and leaving me in the car for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes when he said, I'll be, I'll be there in five minutes. And I started crying, and it opened up this memory of this experience, and that's where the association of the anger with her tardiness came from because I was reliving what my father the experience I had with my father as a child. It was very powerful and healing for both of us. And she became more sensitive to my needs to, for her to be punctual. And, and I came to a deeper understanding of why I was getting upset. It really made a difference in our relationship. I can That's understand awesome. that. That's awesome that you actually figured that out. That's awesome. It was like a flash because the, when she repeated it back to me, that's the whole idea. The person says, you're saying to me, 
that when I do this, that, and the other thing, it makes you do feel this way or that way or whatever it might be, the, the, the resultant uh, response. And it was so powerful, really, really powerful. All right. Um, Rizzo, take the next one. I would love to. Uh, how do you not blame your partner and instead look inside, Kimberly? You understand that blame never once has worked. It, it really gets down to the practicality of has it ever once worked. When you blame someone else, one, you are saying I'm a victim. You're saying I'm helpless. You're saying that that I can do nothing about the situation, which, of course, is just a bunch of you-know-what. And what you do to them is you make them feel helpless, not enough, and shamed. And so that's why it never works. And so why do something that doesn't work? Well, I get angry and things come out of my mouth. Well, grow up. Things don't get to come out of your mouth, especially if they're hurtful to someone else. Oh, well, that's what you do when you love. You forgive someone for hurting you. Stop. If you really love someone, you never, ever deliberately hurt them. And that includes, oh, I was drunk and I didn't mean it. Or sometimes I just get angry and I say things I don't mean. No, you're not. You're not in a mental institution. You say, when you say something, a part of it's always true. A part of it, it is. absolutely do mean. And so... And so part of the rules, if you need love rules, is don't go into a relationship with an adolescent. Make sure the person you are with is another adult who says to you, I commit to be responsible for my behavior. I commit to be responsible for finding my way into loving you. And I commit to allow you to love me. Absolutely. That's a great place to start. Oh, Beautiful. The victim, was, the victim was talking about that yesterday, taking ownership of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Really? Is that on second sight? Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually in the process of writing a major article about ownership, and not just it, it's based on a business experience, but it goes beyond that into personal relationships too. Of course, it does always. Leaders of companies, and I've been a consultant for two years now, for thirty years. That's the first rule: you be responsible for everything that happens in your company, and you share the power with everyone else, so the burden's not too great to bear. Yeah, the idea being that customer service is everyone in, in, a, in a good corporate culture, in a, in a really, uh, really outstanding corporate culture, customer satisfaction is everyone's responsibility from the top all the way down to the bottom. And the, uh, the example that was cited is if you go to any of the Marriott hotel chain, you will find this culture of customer service that's unmatched in any other hotel chain. And the example given, you're in the middle of a seminar and your uh, overhead projector goes down. You walk out into the hallway, and you see a person there with a vacuum from housekeeping vacuuming the hall. And you say, my projector just went down. I need to get it fixed. And in, in any other hotel, they may direct you to the lobby or send you over to one of the courtesy phones. But in the Marriott chain, they will actually walk to the department that's involved, get that person, bring them back, and stay with you until you're happy and, and your problem is resolved. That's true ownership of customer satisfaction. And what would happen if we now switch that to your romance? What would happen if your partner was unhappy and you stayed with them until you understood why they were unhappy and you helped them through it and you and you helped them get for themselves what they need? Absolutely. I know. I know. You catch the red eye to Vegas, baby. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you? What are you doing over River Wildfire Moon? Yo. I think I think somebody spiked your wine tonight. Uh. <laughs> I think you're a bit of a banshee tonight. <laughs> Meanwhile, what if the girl I'm I'm with just doesn't want to work with me on a, on the relationship? Well, okay. Remember that the power is yours. And if the woman does not want to work with you, then my first question I would ask you is, why are you there? Are you are you involved in old patterns of the woman not wanting to cherish you and your communication, not wanting to give to you and let you give to them? Are you once again following your belief systems, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough to love? I would say look to yourself. When we want to change the other person, we have now set ourselves up to fail. Change yourself, it's much easier. Kimberly, you're on point. I just got to say, you are so on point. I love it. I couldn't have said it better myself. Hi. Thank you. Chris is right. Hi, 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 hi. Go ahead, River, you, you wild lady. 
Hey, and you know, my middle name is Wildfire, just because I'm quiet sometimes and I'm reserved and I, I follow the natural order of things doesn't mean that my essence is not uh, irrevocable and wild, okay? I will always do that. <laughs> and, a, and a wildfire catches up with you when you least expect it. That's right. Oh, boy. Uh, let's see, Kimberly. <laughs> how can you really force yourself to do inner work and how does that... Uh, uh, well, how will your book make this easier for individuals to do that? Well, the, the first whole half of the book is about two human beings really reaching inside themselves. And you get to do that with us. You get to go, boy, how did they do that? What's true for me in my life? Oh, my God, I can't believe he said that. Oh, my God, she didn't take that and run with it. You get to do all of that inside yourself and compare it to your own life and what you would say and what you would do and when you would move forward in the relationship and when you would stop the relationship. The whole idea of me sharing my love letters with you is so that you walk the path with me so that it helps you in your life. What can make you want to decide to do the work? How lonely are you? It boils down to that. How lonely are you? If you love yourself, you are probably not lonely and then relationships become a choice. And that's, that's so key because we, we teach people lies about how many people really want to be in romantic relationships. Get this. About a third of the world is looking for soulmates. Only a third. And the reason why we think everyone is is because Madison Avenue uses it to sell. About a third of the world's population is really happy with consecutive relationships, whether they last three years or 30 years, but they're not looking to spend the next 100 years with people, and that's not an exaggeration with life expectancy for the current generation being 120. For some people, the thought of spending that long with one person makes them want to run screaming down the halls. So they are totally healthy, but they choose consecutive relationships. And then get this, these are the ones in hiding. A third of the world doesn't want romantic relationships at all. It's not the type of work they want to do. They prefer to get their love through family and friends. And usually through the adult family they choose that may not be blood at all. Absolutely. And so we agree to punish two-thirds of the world because they're not looking for soulmates. And that's a real mistake. Absolutely. And you know what? We made a mistake. We forgot to ask our wonderful guest, Beverly Hart, where you can get your book, Get Love, and find out more about you and what you do. You know, I must have a past life where I was Beverly because people do that all the time. It's Kimberly. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. It's Kimberly. Of course, of course. <laughs> it, it just makes me smile because it happens. It happens. It happens. I was a child. Okay. I wonder who Beverly is. But in any case, and we made it really easy. The book is called Get Love. The website is called getlove.com. And you go to Amazon and you put in Get Love and you'll find the book. It's real easy. Because what I really want for you, I really want you to get the love you want. Hopefully it starts with self-love and then to learn how to love other people. And, Kimberly, you mentioned the TED Talks before. Did you, did you do a TED Talk? I went to TED for the first time, okay. and that in and of itself was an uh, interesting thing. I don't know if you know, TED takes applications and turns most people away. Right. But, and, and my dream is to talk on TED next year. So add your magic to mine, because I intend to have a very wild conversation about love and shake some people up. It's time we start talking about what's real. And Kimberly Hart, our energy is with you to be on a TED Talk. Thank you. Well, you know, I just want to say uh, a couple things. Um, first, River, you have a friend who listens to the show, John Weathers, who is a friend of mine as well, and, and Victor, and he comments on a lot of what we do. And he, he commented saying, Victor had some things happen. I think this happened to me. That was a timekeeper uh, uh, in the payroll department. He was the same way, goes on. And they said, Stephanie, please tell Chris it's Ahu. Now, how many people howl better than me? He's going to tell me how to freaking howl? Do I, do I got to give a, a demonstration? Chris, you can what? demonstrate, but do recognize John Weathers is a Lakota man, and his name is Wolf Who Smiles, okay? Well, That's well, Indian know, given I like, name. I like Wolf Who Smiles. I think he's a kick-ass guy, but he he's calling me out on my wolf howl. What's up how, baby? How? What are you waiting for? 
You know, I, I, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Chris is part Native American. And when he was a